quite a lot of things to talk about today. So Georg, oh, he's recording. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the March 9th edition of the Chaos Weekly Community Call. So happy to see everybody here. You're all wonderful. Thank you for taking your time this morning or afternoon, evening, whatever time it is for you, and hanging out with us for uh, 50 minutes, the next 50 minutes. Um, so if you need the minutes, we can drop them in here one more time in case you missed that in the chat. Uh, <clears throat> please feel free to um, let us know how you're doing. Add your name to the agenda if you don't mind. If you don't want to do that, that's fine too. Um, and as always, totally fine to keep your cameras off. Um, doesn't matter. It's, it's a do as you wish kind of meeting. So we're just glad you're here. All right, so let's jump right in. Um, the first item on the agenda, of course, is our uh, fourth metrics release, which happened on Friday officially. So congratulations to everyone who worked on those metrics. We had 11 metrics released, new ones. We had five revisions. <clears throat> so now we have 57 metrics, <clears throat> sorry, total, um, that people can use to measure the health of their communities. <clears throat> I am so sorry. I want to give us a, a big shout out to Georg and Kevin, who are both on this call, I believe. Yes, um, they work tire tirelessly to make sure that that release happens um, and they do uh, get everything straight and and um, uh, what's the word I want? Accurate. <laughs> That's the word I want. They uh, make sure that everything lines up and they create this wonderful PDF, which summarizes all of our metrics and the histories of the releases. So. Um, we can link to that in the minutes if we like, but it's also on the uh, the website as well. So huge shout out to Georg and Kevin for that huge amount of work that they do every time we release something officially. So yay. Awesome job, you guys. If you want to get a sense of how much work they're doing, subscribe to the repos on the weekend that <laughs> they're doing the work. <laughs> and you'll, you'll get a sense that way too. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot that goes into it, turns out. Um, so if you would like to help us spread the word and, and let people know about the release, um, we did tweet about it yesterday. So if I dropped that in the minutes, if you want to just retweet, if that's your thing, if you don't, that's fine too, but we would appreciate the signal boost if you are someone who would like to do that. And also I just want a quick shout out to Nicole, who's not on this call, but, um, she created our fancy new social tile that we use for our our tweet this time. So um, our tweets are gonna look prettier thanks to Nicole. So she's awesome. Thank you very much, Nicole, for that. Cause I would not have done that. So, <laughs> so I'm glad that she did. I'm glad she's part of the community that we have such brilliant minds that can create that stuff. So that's awesome. Does anyone have any questions or comments, anything to say that they wanna share? Just echo the huge thank you to everybody and to Georg and Kevin, yeah. Yeah, thank you everyone. <laughs> you should publish uh, Georg and Kevin's uh, metrics on, on the amount of work they did as a preface. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> also just one more comment I have about the, the metrics release. It's really amazing to me to think about all of the things that happened in the last six months. Like if you go back and think about since our last release, all of the stuff that's been going on. And yet we still cranked out 11 new metrics and revised five metrics. Like that's pretty rad, that's pretty awesome. So um, everybody should feel good about this last time because we're pushing through and I, I just love that. I think that's fantastic work on everyone's part. Um, okay, just, so let's, oh, go ahead. I was just reflecting this morning that this is our fourth release of metrics and we're entering year five now of chaos no year four we started in 17. someone do the math but it's quite amazing what we've accomplished as a group a hundred percent plus one plus 10 million on that that's excellent point okay I have a question oh go ahead before, um, sorry to interrupt, but is there a way to see like the metrics that were added and the ones that were changed? It's not obvious to me in the PDF, but maybe there's another place to look. If you go to the end of the PDF, we have the release notes. Okay. Where we list out what has changed 
release history, page 163. Thank you. You're welcome. John, you have to read uh, all the pages first, though, before you get to that. Just Sorry. all 163 pages. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that was a good question. Thank you. Okay, so um, moving on then. Uh, if anybody else has any questions about that, feel free to just interrupt me or jump in. Um, no worries at all there. Uh, but let's talk about the OSS EU submissions. Um, someone has added an idea as working groups as a panel. I would guess that's Matt G. This was me. So this came up, I don't remember what call it was, but Nicole had actually recommended that we put together a panel with representatives from the different working groups probably not all the working groups, that would be quite a few, but um, the different working groups to, to be at OSS EU and just talk about the work that you do and all that kind of stuff. I thought it was a nice idea. Yeah. But then the question came up to our, is there anything else we would like to do as a community to submit to OSS EU? I mean, I have intentions of submitting things related to some of our work on risk and software, if anyone wants to join in on that. They've given us so much time to submit. <laughs> so I guess it's been at the top of my list. Yeah, yeah I mean, this was like have until, no pressure. Yeah, we have until June, I think. We got several months. I, also I don't that know. The, yeah. Oh. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Elizabeth. No, no. I was going to go on to the next thing. So go ahead, Ray. Yeah. No, I, I was thinking, Matt, like either you or like Georg or somebody. You know, we. I mean, obviously, we went through went through a lot of releases. Would it make sense to give a like a? I mean, I don't want to call it the State of the Union because it sounds political. Like state of where chaos is after like however many years it's been. I think so. And I'd love to see a submission yeah. come from maybe the community, whatever that might mean. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. Because lots of times it's individual people that are submitting things about the community. But if we could have yeah. kind of, I like the panel idea. And it, that could be the panel could also be just kind of the state of state of yeah. uh, project. Yeah, or the focus could be, I mean, sorry, I'm, I'm like bouncing ideas off, but uh, rather than, because I think we've been focused on in terms of speakers, people that are actively contributing on working on metrics. I like to hear from like users, like people that have been consuming the community's output and how, how things have been going. And uh, so I don't know, if, I mean, I can't think of like a, like a potential speakers or submitters uh, off the top of my head, but that might be something we can think about. So Ray, I, I yeah. agree with you that I always like yeah. to hear from users and, as well. And when I, mm -hmm. when my uh, Google alert shows me that someone mentions chaos anywhere, I usually reach out and try to get them to come on the podcast. So that's a great place mm -hmm. to also hear from people. Right. Um, and the best users are the ones that are actually involved in chaos is my feeling because they are so engaged in the metrics that they just like to talk with us about what they're doing. So I don't, right. I don't see a problem with uh, asking someone who is actively involved in chaos to do it if they're the ones using the metrics. Yeah, that might be an interesting panel. I feel like it's, well, it's not just an interesting panel. I feel like I'd be interested in general for chaos to hear more from its user base. Um, especially just have been thinking about the number of metrics that we have if you're a brand new user who's starting some sort of program. How are you, how do you navigate it at first? What do you find is most useful and why? Um, to me, like I, I have my own particular history and approach here, but I'd love to hear from others that are kind of starting from scratch and what was more or less helpful. Cause I think that's also useful for us in the project to know how to 
present and make these things useful. So like, I, I think I, I love it in the idea of a panel and a presentation, but I also just love it as a learning mechanism. <laughs> so I just, I'm generally interested in, in better understanding a user perspective of the project. Yeah, I would love that too. That would be really fantastic. All right, cool. Notes taken. So it, it sounds like this event is, it's pretty likely gonna happen face to face is what I've heard through the grapevine. So- I'll be terrified. Um, I'll be yeah. like terrified of everybody that I see. <laughs> no, so yeah, I mean, I think like, obviously I talked to somebody at the LF, like they thought August in Vancouver was too early, but late September, uh, they might change the venue, for example, if things in Ireland don't improve over the next few months, but I think they have backups. So don't buy your crossed. plane tickets. <laughs> no, no, I wouldn't buy anything right now. But so yeah, but things may change, but and they may do something it, it it might look very different because of the pandemic. I mean, obvious things like reduced capacity, uh the the show floor is gonna look different, but so fingers crossed. Um, I might be submitting a proposal for a metric stock in general. So if, if I do, I'll, I'll let this group know because I most certainly will mention chaos in some capacity. Okay, anything else on this topic? Okay. Uh, thanks for all those ideas. These are awesome. And we have, uh, as someone said, we have quite a while to think about those. As, so um, just keep that in your mind and we'll, we can bring it up again next week. <clears throat> okay, so let's move on to Google Summer of Code. We were accepted again for the fourth year in a row. Hooray, hooray, hooray. Uh, we have made some fantastic uh, connections with students over the years. So we are super, super excited. Um, Georg, I don't know if you want to talk a little about it or not to put you on the spot. Sorry. <laughs> well, Google Summer of Code is starting. The process is from here on out that we will see an influx of candidates who are interested in chaos and participating in the program. So I encourage everyone to be kind and respectful and reply to their questions. We will see them on the mailing lists, on IRC, on the issue trackers. And the mentors uh, have taken it among themselves to, um, to provide some guidance and feedback as we are developing project ideas or the, the students, the Google Summer of Code students have to develop project ideas that they want to do during the project time. Uh, we have some ideas that we gave them, but they have to really flush it out, develop a timeline, uh, develop specific deliverables. It's a 10 week program, part time involvement. So um, what is that 180 hours total. And yeah, the next thing once uh, the next thing is the applications then that we will get um, all the project ideas, and then we can see who has really good ideas on what to do. How many did we get this year? We will decide, or we have not applied for any specific number yet. So first we will uh, talk with all the candidates, help them develop their project ideas. And then when the submission deadline is due, then we look through the applications and decide how many we would like to mentor. And we request the, that many slots from Google. I had a couple, one question. Georg, is the stipend the same? Do you know the student stipend? Not off the top of my head. Okay. I don't then, think it okay. changed significantly. Okay. Um, there might be some funkiness in per country because everything is adjusted for inflation and GDP changes. So that kind of blew up a little bit this year. 
So depending on what country you're in, you might see a little bit more variance. Gotcha, thanks. And then the other, the comment was just kind of a reminder, like in these calls, we don't talk about like good or bad <laughs> students. So just because these are open calls and I know that some people who are students are interested and are attending these calls. So I think to Georg's point, it's always about trying to be as constructive and positive as we can be. So this is a question for Georg and Sean. If someone has questions about anything regarding the this program, should they contact both of you, one of you, somebody else? What would you recommend? I would like to see it on the mailing list so that everyone benefits from the answer. So anyone who is interested or has a question, um, as Georg said, just post it to the mailing list. Um, and that information is on our participate page. If you're not familiar with that, um, it's just chaos.community slash participate. There's links to all the meetings and all of the mailing lists and everything. So um, yeah, <laughs> there you go. Anyone else have any questions, comments? No, it's exciting. What is the, what is the next step for uh, these potential projects? the the individuals who are going to be mentors what what do we need to do or what do they need to do so we have the student application period coming up next so today is the announcement and then we'll see interested students come in and they will have they will look through the project ideas that we have and then reach out to the mentors to discuss details and built out a detailed project plan, which can be like a 20 page document with a timeline, here are the deliverables, here's what I will do every week. Um, this is the outcome that I'm producing. And this uh, will be developed until the beginning of April or mid April. And then April 13 is the deadline for submissions. And then we have one month for reviewing and deciding what we, well, one month after April 13 until the projects are announced. And during that time, we have to review the proposals, um, request the slots, and then work with Google to select the students that we want. So the next thing is really work with the students on their proposals. So the, the students themselves have to create the proposal on how they will address the idea. Uh, where do the micro tasks fit into this flow? We are asking the students who want to participate to add their name in a markdown file and link to their micro tasks. And the micro tasks are a way for us to select students um, on top of the proposal that they make. So just making sure that they have some basic skills that we would need in the project. Okay, any final questions? Going once, going twice. There's a All question right. in chat. Oh. Close. <laughs> so close. <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. Um, when can we expect micro tasks for the list of project ideas? So, I think that's up to the students, if I just heard Georg correctly, to develop those. I think the question is when the mentors will post the micro tasks. And right now, going through our Google Sum of Code ideas page, none of the mentors have posted the micro tasks yet. And I keep reminding the mentors, I cannot promise you when they will get to it. It'll be soon. I think some of us are just waiting to see if we were accepted. Would it, would it be helpful to set a deadline? Always. Uh, yeah, can we also give a kind of uh, statistics of the previous years, like how many students applied, how many were retained, and the proportion of those who were not, because you made the, in, the initial uh, announcement, might be some students might be wondering what happened at the end if I'm not selected. 
You understand what I mean? And if there is yeah. some tips to, um, to, if there is some tips to guide uh, the potential students, what are the, those kind of things that can increase their chances? We are not promising anything here, you know, just to make sure we are communicating effectively. In the, in the past, with the, you know, we do have a list of projects available and there'll be micro tasks. And in the past, it's been a combination of were they effective at completing a micro task, which is a basic demonstration of their capacity to figure out how to contribute to a project. And then is there a proposed way of attacking the, the proposed project, um, you know, well fleshed out, well thought out? Uh, those are those are the two main things that we're assessing is kind of their design vision, at least when I do it, it's their design vision and their basic demonstrated competence. So Armstrong's question, I think, was do we have a history of how many people had expressed interest and how many people were essentially awarded? Just so so like the if there were 20 yeah. people that had expressed interest in say seven like came on for the summer with with uh, the chaos project just to give people an understanding of what the likelihood of success might be or how competitive it might be i think that's what you're getting at is that right armstrong yeah and and i was yeah i was trying to answer that question be when it comes to the interest i guess the only thing that you add is there are there are lots of students who ask questions on the, the micro tasks, but never do a pull request or never submit a proposal. Um, and so I would include those in the ones. So as a percentage, those would be included. If you want to talk about the people who have actually submitted proposals, um, I don't know. Last year we had 20. Yeah. So and we had... of those 20, we selected, I think, nine. Okay. So you know prior years, Gary? Yeah. I can also go back in history. Yeah. The Git log is quite helpful. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Takes me a while to hunt down older years. Mm -hmm. Do we want to move on while you're doing that, Georg? We can come back to it, not to put you on the spot. <laughs> Everyone just staring at you while you're while you're working on this. Uh, the year before, we had fourteen, and I think we selected four. Sounds right. Yeah. I do think over the over. From like this will be our fourth year doing it. I think the quality of the proposals last year were much higher than what we've seen before. Um, so I think students are learning or sharing with each other what a good proposal looks like. I think I think also the students who are accepted they end up being advocates for our projects and for the GSOC program in general. Um, and I know like in the case of Augur, uh, most of the ones, all except one. One of the six we had last summer has continued to contribute to Augur. Um, so I, I think there's a, they enjoy, they enjoy participating with the chaos project and they tell their friends. And that's why I think maybe our numbers of applicants keep going up. Okay, well, let's go ahead and move on because we do have other um, issues to discuss. <clears throat> and we have about 24 minutes left. So um, let's move on. The next one to talk about is groups.io. Let's talk about it again. Yeah, here it is again. So this is from like two years ago. So obviously we have the lists, the email list. And um, we currently have these. Uh, chaos um, groups for chaos and groups for chaos uh, DEI. They're hidden right now. So, but Brian Warner set them up. Thanks, Brian. And the question is, do we ever want to start using groups.io as our 
basically email like threaded communication channel. I do know that um, the, the email list that we're using right now is no longer supported at the Linux Foundation. So, I mean, it's okay. We have administrative rights to it, but um, I just, I think it's slowly being deprecated that platform. So there you go. That's the question. Do we want to move? Do we want to run to in, in parallel? Georg, maybe we could encourage Google Summer of Code um, people who are interested to start using groups.io. Like that might be a, just listening to you talk, that might be a good place to move that conversation. I don't know. Yeah, I don't remember the details. It was a reason why this was put on hold was because LFIT, like, they didn't have the time to support this or they put this on hold. I can't remember the discussion from a few years ago. It was convenience. They wanted to push us to groups IO, but mm -hmm. then several communities pushed back. And so they stopped the migration across the board and we were like, right. we'll stay. It's convenient. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, so I think for, I mean, if I remember from a few, was several years ago when I went through this migration. I think for like most people, you're not going to notice any change. You're just going to get your email through your inbox. It just it makes it easier for like administrators because Groups IO actually has a user interface uh, versus the other mailing list. So I think for most people, they won't notice any difference. But user interface aspect of a mailing list is is nice especially if it's well developed so yeah. i mean I, I think for most people you just get these email in your whatever your email client is anyways whether it's gmail or whatever it is so i don't think most people will make any difference but i guess this is my way of saying i think migration is just a good idea it's a supported platform and i think the impact for the most people will be pretty minimal like The other platform we thought about going to is Discourse. Yeah. But that would be more involved for migration because it's more forum software than a mailing list software. Yep. Any other thoughts one way or the other? <laughs> right. <laughs> As I'm the happy person to who, stay. <laughs> I was going to say, as the person who is usually the one that like cleans out the spam and all the stuff in the mailing list, I would totally support a better user interface than the one from like 1995. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know like what's involved in like how hard is it to migrate over? I have no idea what's involved there. I mean, I, guess I assume would... that aspect of it, Brian could help us, but I mean, it, it, it's, it's not a lot. I mean, I, I've done it for like OPNFB or some of the other LFM projects. It was pretty simple, but it should be LF person doing this versus like, like any of, uh, one of us okay. on the call. I can circle back with Brian, maybe yeah. include you, Elizabeth, just in the email thread, just to yeah, see what would be, great. be involved. Okay. Especially if we don't have to do anything, like if they're going to do it all, yeah. then yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's just like a nicer user interface, like I said, on, on top of mailman. Um, so. I mean, the, the topic of discourse is an interesting one. Cause I think in the past we have talked about a forum type of communication but I don't really remember where that conversation went if we just decided, eh, we have enough with GitHub and all in the calls and everything else, if that's too much. Is that, does anyone else remember that, those conversations? Or that's, where has, of, uh, that's where a lot of these go. We're just always like, eh, yeah. it's, it's all good. I, <laughs> <laughs> I think if we're, gonna, if we're gonna add a new piece of technology, it needs to be based on need. Otherwise we're, we're not going to see a lot of adoption. Yeah. Doesn't groups allow for threaded discussions or no? Like, can't you see? On um, groups IO? Of, yeah. Or, or no? I don't remember. But 
I mean, I think that was the one advantage. So like, if I look at um, something like discourse, like how sustain uses it, I really, I like the history of the entire conversation around a topic. It's nice, it's easy to read and scroll right. back up and down as to what's going on there. Does, if groups does that, I think, that's does. A, I think that's a step forward. I it does do that. With you. Uh, it, also, it also allows you to, uh, I think, to subscribe to kind of subtopics. And then you can, you can go through and you can kind of unwrap those topics. Because then we can have a topic on Google Summer of Code interest, a topic about metrics release, a topic about whatever risk, you know, about the different working groups. It, it just seems to make a little bit more sense to me for capturing conversation. Yeah, so it seems like there's really no reason to stay with what we're doing, so. It looks like it also supports the use of like hashtags for topic categorization. So hashtags and subgroups and there's a calendar that's built in as well. I think for me, it would go back to what Ray said. I would just continue using Gmail to send and receive emails and don't worry about any of these other features. But that, that would be okay, right? Because then you could continue to do that. But if other people want to check the threaded discussion, it's there to check, right? I assume. I'm, I'm asking like that logistically, that's how this could still work. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in it right now. Yes, that's, uh, I'm looking at the features and that is, that is something you can do with that. Okay, cool. Decision made. All right. I love that. Does, I love when that happens. Quick question. Do they migrate the archive so that I'll we have ask. it all in groups? I, I thought about that too. I'll ask Brian just to kind of get a little bit of detail because it may just be like stop one and start the other, but if we can move to your point, if we can move some of that discussion over as an archive, not sure. And if we can do that, it would be great to combine the two archives that we have because we changed the mailing list name at some point. So we have right. an old archive, we have the current archive, and then we would have a third place if we can't move it. But if we can merge all into one, then one more plus point to I, I doubt there's a merge all button, <laughs> but maybe. That's an excellent question. So we will definitely circle back with Brian on that, I think, because I think that would be helpful to have all of that saved somewhere because we, we have referenced those conversations in the past. So that'd be good. Okay, let's go on. So we got about 15 minutes. Um, the next one is we have our next chaos software hackathon. Um, this one's on Augur again, and it will be <clears throat> March 13th, which is Saturday from 7 a.m. to 12 p.m. Central U.S. time, uh, <laughs> Chicago time. Um, sure. Or short days, the last day before daylight savings time. Uh, the registration link is in the minutes if you want to. I just, Kevin, I, in answer to your question, is the web page created? I literally just did that three minutes before the meeting, <laughs> the meeting started. So uh, yes, it is, uh, but it's not anywhere else. So if you want to, if we, I can do a, a pull request to add it somewhere if we want. Where is it um, right now? Where's the link? It's oh, in the minutes. I'm sorry. Yep. Um, for some reason, it didn't recognize that it looks like, but as an actual link, but that's okay. Um, uh, Sean, you want to talk a little about what we're doing at that hackathon? Just like super quick? Yeah, the hackathon is going to focus on building Augur metrics uh, collection, data collection workers, and uh, showing folks how that part is done and how to, you know, if you've got a data source that you want to collect data from that we don't currently collect data from. We have a pretty good pattern that we just released. Augur just did a release last night. We labeled it COVID party because what else would we label it when I'm responsible for labeling? And um, pretty excited about just talking with people about what kind of data we want to collect and showing them that we sort of have a standard base set of methods that all the workers use now and 
it's uh, much easier to build a new data collection worker. So I'm excited about the hackathon. Anyone have questions? For no, Sean? I just say thanks for doing these, Sean. I mean, that's a commitment. So thank you. Oh. Yeah, that's part of being on the team. Um, excuse me, I have a question over there. Um, okay, so um, thank you, Sean, for organizing the, the event. I think it will be quite helpful for we new members. So I, I just want to ask if there will be a similar event for Grimo Lab. Because since I've joined this organization, this, this is the second event we are organizing for August. So I just want to know if there will be a similar event for Grimo Lab. I'm, I'm happy to collaborate with anyone at Grimoire Lab or Grimoire Lab is, uh, of course, could have their own event. Um, Elizabeth and I kind of have worked out a pattern for getting the, them set up. And I think, I just don't know as much about Grimoire Lab, but um, I'm happy to participate in that kind of a hackathon. And maybe Georg, that's something you can take back to the Grimoire Lab folks and see what their availability is for that. I know that they're all quite busy actually you know, doing what they do. Yeah, we, our idea was to see how the hackathons are being received that you're hosting. And then once you and uh, Elizabeth work out the kinks, then we can learn from you how to run these. And then we can think about doing one for Grimoire Lab. Yeah, what, one of the things that we'll be announcing, I think by next week is these, these two hours sort of get your computer configured sorts of hackathons. Uh, a lot of what especially student and early stage career developers struggle with are they may have more than one version of Python installed and reconciling that when you're trying to create a virtual environment <clears throat> can be a bit of work. And uh, the other thing sometimes that folks struggle with is if their local operating system has the right version of GCC and Fortran compilers installed and each operating system is a different way of making those things happen so um, these separate events are really intended to help everyone be ready uh, to work with i think either grimoire lab or auger because since they both have a lot of python they both probably have many of those same machine configuration challenges um, and so we'll put some dates on the calendar for those by the next meeting so i i added the uh I added the link to the web page to the uh, the front page of the Chaos website, so there is a there's a connection. Hey, there. thanks, uh, Kevin. That was no quick. Problem. Uh, could we maybe think about what a permanent presence on the website would look like? Is there how how would you want these these hackathons to be represented on the website, and should we start adding them to the shared calendar as well? I think adding the shared calendar makes sense. I think Georg is, has the right idea before we promote them and mechanize them and, and make them sort of a standard offering. We need to experiment enough to kind of know what works and what doesn't, you know? Um, so I would, I would want to set like a calendar or a plan out clearly until we've done experiments with a few of these different ways of working. I'd also like to, uh, and you know, have working group focused hackathons as well, where we can maybe build out some of the metrics the working groups are focused on. So, Kevin, I think in answer to your question, um, I think probably by sorry by the next okay. uh, web content meeting, we might have a better idea of how that would look the best and work the best on the website. Is that fair to say, Sean? Would you say? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Is yeah, that okay? No, no pressure. Just uh, just something to think about. Okay. Awesome. So we'll add it to the agenda for the next web content meeting. Okay. Any other questions for Sean or anyone about the the hackathon series or the the extra educational series we're going to do? All right, moving on. We have eight minutes. We're doing good. 
chaos data policies. Let's talk about that. That's me. So there has been a request to add a data policy statement with respect to chaos and we've been working on this and there's a draft in the minutes. So if you want to take a look. And I think the idea is to just simply host this on the web page. Can somebody repost the minutes? I they were posted before I got here. I don't have them in my chat. Thank you. And feel free to add suggestions or comments. Part of what um, led up to creating this draft was a common request from people asking, hey, I want to use chaos metrics, but how do I make sure I do it in a compliant way? And creating this project data policy, one of the ideas that we had was maybe we can create something that other communities can copy and paste or adapt to their own projects to be more transparent about how data is used in open source projects. I think for me, the, the our data policy kind of became an issue when we started collecting emails for the badging and the uh, community reports. Uh, does this, I'm, I'm trying to look through it now, does this address how we, how we handle data that we collect specifically through those, those types of forms? Yes. <laughs> Who's reading it again? Point, point two. Yeah. You see that, Kevin? It's a yep, point I two. do. Yep, thank you. I might add Did a we... statement about Augur in point three to just to indicate we do the same thing. Or how that data is stored or the security of that data. How is security, security, security how is security a question when the data is public? I mean, what are we securing it against? Oh, so, so form form data is public. So, if we collect data on a form, we make that data public. Is that what you're saying? I see. That's what you're talking about. No. It sounds like we need a, a separate clause that distinguishes how we handle different kinds of data. I think right now we have a pretty good list of all the places that we're collecting and or sharing information back. But to Kevin's point, we treat emails differently than we would treat, say, activity around the chaos project in the dashboard. You think that can just see where I just put point six, or should we just have a whole new state section? I think it might make sense to have a, a section dedicated to data handling okay. like where the okay. first part is where all the data is coming from mm -hmm. and then a clause on how we treat different classes of data which means that we have to create class buckets um, I won't write it now I'm just taking notes right in here Matt, is this something we should have Mike Dolan from the LF look at from a legal standpoint? Yeah, I think so. Once we're kind of done. Okay. 
So wondering if we can borrow from say like NIST PII levels just to have, because I gen, there's generally accessible gradations of PII. Um, and I'd love to use a third party definition versus creating our own if we don't have to. Agreed. I'll check it out and I'll bring it back to the group next week or something. Is that the is that the standard that goes up to like level four is the most private data like your medical records or is that a different standard, Sophia? I'm looking at now. Know. I they have a low, medium, high. That's not that helpful. Okay. I mean, it, it is. All right. Yeah. Um, at Google, we have our own, but like we defined it related to our own mm -hmm. categorization. Um, whereas say like yeah. this is more general. So like low would be public use, public content, medium being um, email, no confidential data, but still personally identifiable, identifiable information where highly sensitive would include IP to financial records to social security numbers. So that's clearly in, the, in a much higher echelon than anything else. Yep. So kind of handling low and medium by this definition. Um, but I'm, not looking at the NIST site. So this might be someone else's entirely distinct classification, so. Totally fair, totally fair. Yeah, at the university, we have these levels and level level four is where it's your, med basically I'm looking at medical records. I have to be like in almost a locked vault to do that kind of data, data analysis. I could poke around and see if I can find any ones that I like, because it looks like everybody has their own. <laughs> But if there's one <laughs> more standard, like I would love it to come from something like NIST because, well, it's generally a standard level organization that most people draw their security policies around. Agreed. Uh, what about when we create, uh, when we create contributor lists? Would that be for the is release? That a, yeah, for example, on the release or on the website, when we mention specific contributors, things like that, is there a, a is it is this addressed? Draft something for that too. I assume we, we can put that in a class of its own because we can ask contributors if they want to be named versus there's there isn't that additional opt in opt out step if we're collecting data from a central repository that's public. But yeah, I agree it should be in here. So sorry. Maybe that maybe that goes in the uh, the up the the previous section the community community data policy. It's like by, by participating in this project, your, your identity may be used to create contributor lists or you may be mentioned in a tweet or things like that. Kevin, why don't you and I connect because we're at the end of time and we can oh. try to work on this? Certainly. I was just going to have to cut it off. So thank you for doing that already, Matt. Um, we had two things we didn't get time to talk about. Should we add them to next time or what do you want to do? Yeah, next time. I think I don't, thing, don't I'm guessing that Sophia it. posted it. Yeah, it's just an FYI in case there are folks that are looking to submit for research grants. It's just another place to submit proposals. So I just wanted to make it available and known, but we don't have to talk about it. So oh. that's the ocean. That's listed on there. Mm. Awesome. So if you're a researcher, check the minutes for a tip from Sophia. I've been kind of watching the work that they've been doing. I think this was funded a couple of years ago. So it's been pretty cool stuff. Fantastic. All right, everyone. Super productive meeting. Thanks again for coming. And we will see you all next week. Have a great rest of your week. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.